presence now, that you would be with us in this time together, that in this new venture, this new beginning, that you would steady our nerves, encourage us, and speak to us so that we may feel that we have a task and that we have a reason for being in this place. We ask it in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Him enough to let him do it. 
It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. And we spoke also last week about tram, the word tram has developed all sorts of meanings, um, but largely they orientate, they work around this understanding that tram means a sacred space. And originally this would have been a sacred space without homes, without a church. Uh, indeed, we have probably one of the original stones, which would have just been in the middle of this hill, where people would have sat out in the open when the sun rose and um, worshipped together, shared things together. But we all know that words take on different meanings. Probably in our lifetime, there's words that we know and have used and we've heard in our childhood, which have a completely different meaning now. Won't list them, I'm sure you can think of some which come to mind. And mission is one of those. Mission, the concept we have of mission, is only about 100 years old. The concept we have of mission is that we have a faith, it's really good, I need to share it, and I need to go out there and tell people about it. Over 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago, there was an American called Charles Finney. And he developed that idea of mission. And indeed, he was the first one to have lots of these big tent missions right across America. And then that idea came over to Britain with Dwight Moody in the 1920s and 30s, and then in the 50s and 60s. And a lot of our church life and thinking now is developed by that American idea of mission. It actually flows out of the American understanding of positive thinking. If you believe your life to be good and you think positively, your life will get even better and you'll be able to share it with others. It's a very American philosophy. But that's not the understanding of mission we find in the New Testament. New Testament's dominated by a word we don't use very often and we probably have different understandings of what it means. The New Testament is dominated by a word grace. And it is related um, to the way that the word nice was originally used. We use the word nice now in a patronizing way. But nice and niceness is connected to grace. It's this idea that something wonderful has been done. Something wonderful has been done for us as individuals and as a group without anything expected in return. And we read in the passage that God is doing things. It's not us doing things. It's his grace which is moving things forward in this world. And so grace needs to be a major part of what we're about here in Flam. The community at large must be able to see from the way that we're happy, not only with ourselves, but with each other, that we have accepted this idea of grace, that something magical, something wonderful has been revealed to us. But in creation, in community, in the world around us, something special has been experienced by all of us. This understanding of grace. Um, Oaxaca. I don't know if any of you like food, um, but the other night, Friday night, a friend came down from previous parish in England, haven't seen him since way before um, Covid. Interestingly, um, he didn't this time, but he used to cut my hair. Um, that's how I got to know him. Um, actually, he's a landscape gardener, um, he's not a hairdresser, you can tell, yes. So he's a landscape gardener, he goes around doing gardens, and he used to come to our church to watch films, but he was never interested in church. He was never interested in coming to worship. 
You say he didn't, spirituality of God wasn't part of his life. Spirituality for him was outside, being in gardens, in woodlands, and just experiencing creation. That was enough for him. He didn't want to come to church. But he came to our films. He liked the films. He liked even more um, the conversation afterwards over wine and, and um, food. And he became part of our church community over 11 years. He never really ever came to the church worship, but he came to every other event because he saw that this was a group of people who it was nice to be around. Well, he likes food and he came up on Friday and we said, right, we'll go into the city and we'll take him to a restaurant. And we took him to Oaxaca, which is around the side of John Lewis of the Hayes and is a Mexican restaurant. And as they do in a lot of restaurants now, that the waitress came over and explained the menu. Have you been here before? You say no, and then go for this big spiel of how you can order food, which doesn't seem to be any different to any other restaurant, but nevertheless, you need to. And they write all over the menu, and I recommend this. Oh, a pricey one, okay. And I recommend this wine with it, of course you do. And, and went right through the menu, uh, scribbling away as she did, and then the last thing she said, oh, and today, and she got a uh, like post -it, printed post-it note and stuck it on all our menus. She said, we've got a special treat today. It's free if you would like to try it. We have a salsa, which we want all our guests to try, and it's made from crickets. <laughs> and I just sort of went silent. But uh, Jack, our friend, he said, oh, that's wonderful. If it's free, we'll try it. Will we, indeed? And so she brought these crickets. And one of the things the restaurant stands for, everything is locally sourced, everything is organic, everything um, is plastic free, and nothing is wasted. Um, there's all these statements around the restaurant and on the menu, and so it's, it's a wonderful, in a sense, to be in a restaurant to contribute to that effort. So, Jack said, um, actually these crickets are very nice, this salsa. Um, so where do you get your crickets from? Uh, somewhere, because I know actually there is a farm in West Wales which is started to um, have produce crickets and flies. It's the protein of the future, we're told. And the waitress said, Well, actually, we have ours flown in from Malaysia. <laughs> and he said, Well, how do you prepare? And she said, Well, they just come, they come frozen in a pack. And so we had the salsa, it just tasted like salsa. You couldn't say, I've just tasted cricket. You couldn't notice that taste. But can you see, straight away, their message, locally sourced, organic, plastic free, was undermined, even though it's a free gift, by that one item at the beginning. It's a free gift, we're giving it to you free. By the way, we've shipped it in on plane from Malaysia, and it's covered in plastic and we didn't prepare it because it was ready packaged by some people who had paid much in Malaysia. That's only a small illustration. But very often, that's how the church appears to the wider people when we go out and tell a message. A message and what we're saying doesn't actually correspond to their experience when they come to church, when they experience community. And so maybe the suggestion is that we concentrate on the quality of our community, the quality of our experience with each other, and less on the messages that we want to preach to them. I mentioned, I think, in the sermon earlier, um, it came to mind, uh, another memory, that when I was young, I was made to watch on a Friday night on the BBC The Nun's Story. And I remember I was only five or six, and I loved the idea that this nun went to Africa, Audrey Hepburn went to Africa, she had all sorts of adventures, and it seemed a brilliant life. And I remember saying to my parents, when I grew up, I want to be a nun too. <laughs> and, it took him a while as they smiled to explain to me that it might not be possible, although who knows these days, all things are changing, who knows. Um, we do get to wear a dress from time to time, so they send me out to Africa. They weren't so keen on this professor with a big moustache. He didn't seem to have any qualities where he would survive in the middle of nowhere in Africa. But he persuaded them by the only way he could think. And that's what he said, I will pay for everything myself. That persuaded the missionary society straight away. He would pay for the hospital. And so he moved out to Africa, 
not on his own, because I forgot to say, there was a nurse that worked under him and was very much caught up with the same idea as Albert, and so they decided to get married and they moved out together. It took months to get to this part of Africa, then they had to hack through the jungle. And they were 2,000 miles away in the middle of this part of the jungle from any other major um, town and inhabitants. And over the years, they built up this small hospital into a team of hospitals and dealt with so many different issues, mainly leprosy. And he, as I mentioned last week, we're probably facing a future where no Christian will win the Nobel Prize, largely because the way we separate our faith from the world of the intellect. When you go to university now, you separate theology away from the other subjects because it can't deal with some of the questions the other subjects throw up. And one of the things we want to explore here in CLAM is once again to tackle some of the big questions. And Albert was the last person, last theologian, to win the Nobel Prize. Albert said, the purpose of life is to serve and to show compassion and the will to help others. It's in our doing, not in our thinking. Our thinking, as I've said, will be important. It will be important to explore all sorts of subjects and areas and really challenge some of the ideas we have at the moment and to say, actually, is that true? Does that work? And what can we replace that idea with? But in the end, it's how we live, how we explore the creation God has given us and experience his grace. And finally, I'm going to introduce you to someone else who will probably be mentioned from time to time. Um, this is someone I met quite a few years ago now. He's um, older than this picture. He's in his late 80s. And he's called Wendell Berry. And he was someone who grew up in the middle of nowhere in America, on a farm, went off to university, wanted to become a novelist. And he lived away in university in a big city and decided, in the end, he had no roots. How could he write about people and communities if he was just living anonymously in a city? So he returned to his hometown. He bought a farm. And for the next 50 years, he's put down roots. And one of his claims, and he's written lots of poetry, lots of novels, but he farms as well. One of his claims and messages to all of us is if we're going to experience creation, if we're going to experience God's grace, wherever we find ourselves now, we attempt to put down roots. It doesn't matter how long you are in a particular place. But putting down roots means you spend time with others, you give yourself to others. How often do we know people who experience life, they're part of something, but they're not really part of something. We all have that feeling maybe, but what we want to do here in Plan is help each other to get over those issues, those problems of being able to feel part of something bigger than ourselves, to encourage each of us to put down roots in this place. For however long we are, however long we share that time with each other, they need to be deep roots rather than shallow, shallow connections and relationships. And so I'll leave you with this. Wendell Berry said, it may be when we no longer know what we have to do, we have to come to our real work. About when we no longer know which way to go, we have become, begun our real journey. So the challenge for us in this congregation is that we're not going to create a mission statement. We're not going to create aims. We're not going to create a list of things which we feel compelled to do. But we're going to take time to build relationships, to build roots, to connect, to wonder at God's grace and his creation. And then we might find that's all we have to do. If you want to call it mission, 
That might be it. It might not be a long list of programs that we all have to rush around and attempt to complete. It might be the simple task of living that we've got an attempt to try and improve upon. So hopefully as we share as a community, living life will be our focus and our aim. Let us pray. Father, we know that all of us from time to find time find life and the act of doing overwhelming. We find ourselves being pulled from pillar to post, being stressed from all the concerns which seem to press in on all of us. We pray for those who may feel stressed and anxious at this time. We pray that this place will become a haven where people can find rest, quietly experience your grace, and put down roots and build relationships which are supportive and can carry all of us through the difficult times. We pray that as we explore themes and topics that we have taken for granted for many years and we challenge ourselves to reinterpret them, that you would give all of us patience and courage to hang in there at times when we're struggling, we're struggling to understand and be clear about what is the way forward. We pray also that as time goes on, that you would draw others to be part of this project, to be part of this community. But not only Clanchesant, but further field, we understand and know Clan as a place where people are nice, where people are not afraid of the big questions, where people are generous, where time is well spent in the company of others. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.
and love of your creation. We ask it in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon all of us now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.